Uh, now, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you're very welcome to the Institute of International European Affairs. Um, we're delighted to be joined by uh, Gilles de Kerkov, uh, EU Counterterrorism Coordinator, whom I will introduce now. But just to remind everybody that uh, to switch your phones to silent, if you if you would, feel free to tweet. Um, uh, the comments uh, at the beginning will be on the record, and the Q and A afterwards will be uh, subject to the Chatham House rule. So uh, we would encourage you to uh, ask questions um, in due course. So let me introduce the speaker, first of all, um, who I understand learned English in Ireland um, some, some time ago. So we'll let you pass judgment <laughs> in due course. Um, so Gilles de Kirchhoff is currently the EU's counterterrorism coordinator position he's held since December 07. This position was established in 2004 after the adoption of the Declaration on Combating Terrorism. In this capacity, he coordinates the work of the European Union in the field of counterterrorism, maintains an overview of all uh, the instruments at the Union's disposal, closely monitors the implementing of EU, EU counterterrorism uh, strategy. Previously, Mr. de Kirchhoff served as the Director for Justice and Home Affairs at the EU Council General Secretariat uh, in, in 1995 to 2007 and served in various capacities in the Belgian government before then, including as Minister of Justice and Minister of Economic Affairs between 93 and 95. He is also currently a Professor of European Law at the Catholic University of Leuven, the Free University of Brussels and the St. Louis University of Brussels and has written numerous books on European law, human rights, security, and counterterrorism. So, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the invitation and for the nice introduction. Uh, it's it's not only a, an honor to be invited by the Institute, but it's a, a real pleasure for me to be back. Um, as you said, I um, spent more than a month here in Dublin in 1971 to try to uh, learn English, and if my English remains poor, it's not because the teacher were not good, it's just because I'm not, <laughs> that, that's so gifted for uh, foreign languages, but, but I do my best. And the second one is, when I started uh, working for the uh, GERA Secretary of the Council, one of the first um, um, challenge we had uh, was to answer a concern by the then Prime Minister, I think it was John Britton, uh, of the murder of a journalist here in, in Dublin. And, and we asked us what to do, and we launched, uh, we advised the, the then presidency, uh, Irish presidency, to set up a, a high level group on organized crime. Um, and that has really been the start of a lot of our work um, in, in justice and home affairs. And, and then I, I had the chance to see uh, John Britton a lot more when he was uh, chairing one of the working group of the convention which uh, drafted uh, the constitutional treaty. And um, I remember that I tried my best to convince him to move uh, just this, what remained in the, what the so-called third pillar uh, into the first pillar to move uh, security into the uh, uh, community competence at the time. It took me some, a, a bit some efforts, but then he was completely convinced uh, uh, and, and it uh, changed completely the way we are working. And um, I will try to illustrate that even if um, the, the Lisbon Treaty is a bit the, the mini treaty which uh, uh, keeps most of the content of the Constitutional Treaty, has made uh, internal security a, a shared competence between the member states and the European Union, we've always, um, in, in recent years, described the role of the EU as being in support of the member states, quite modestly, not taking the lead. We are modestly providing uh, money, uh, adopting legislation, creating legal framework, uh, setting up uh, agencies in support of the member states. And I will try to explain in the 20, 25 minutes I have that um, in the last three years, we, we're no longer only in a support capacity. I think we're have decided to be much more proactive uh, for a, a reason, a simple reason that if you ask um, in the polls to EU citizens where they would like to see more Europe, they always put security, counterterrorism, border control on top of their concern. I, one of the most recent Eurobarometers was 82% of the people who are asked where they would like to see more Europe. And that message went through and was well understood by both the President of the Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, and the President of 
uh, the European Council, uh, Mr. Tusk. Um, they have uh, decided to launch a new concept, which they call the security union. When you look at, at the monetary union, that, that is quite ambitious. Um, and they, uh, the president of the commission has appointed a, a full-time commissioner for security, Julian King. And um, I'm impressed by what we have uh, done the last three years. It's quite impressive in terms of new legislation, new concept, uh, with boost or agency, Europol is now really involved, uh, now in, in CT, counterterrorism. Um, so there is a, a, a quite significant change, and I will try to illustrate that. But let me first start by a, a quick snapshot on, on the way I see uh, the threat. No need um, to tell uh, you how much uh, it remains serious. In many member states, they still um, have a, a quite a high level. Even if Belgium reduced from three to two, I think it, it, it's still serious in the UK, in France as well. Uh, and if you look at the, 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 the most recent uh, Europol report, uh, the TSAT report, on 2017, uh, its um, uh, member states reported a total of 205 foiled, failed, or completed terrorist attack, i.e. a 45% uh, increase uh, compared to 2016. Uh, 68 people have been killed, 844 injured, 1,000 people arrested and so on, I could continue. It's, it's, it's really uh, important and significant. But it's not just uh, serious. What is worrying is that the threat is much more complex than it was on the day after 9-11. On the day after 9-11, in a way, life was quite easy. We had one enemy, AQ, uh, struck like a multinational company. Uh, few people, they were in the hundreds. Now we have a much more diverse uh, threat, uh, many more groups with franchises and affiliated groups, uh, many more people. We're not in the hundreds anymore. We're in the, in the thousands. Um, this morning, going to the airport, listening to the radio, uh, the chairman of the International Crisis Group was um, asked to comment on this, and he said, we have to accept uh, we failed. In a way, we have not been very good. We have not reduced uh, the threat of terrorism. It, it's, it's a bit of collective failure, and we have to ask ourselves, what did we do wrong? Um, so the threat is, is much more diverse. And, and uh, if you look at the, the source of threat we have now, um, you have homegrown, uh, which um, we believe is the, the most serious threat. Um, we have the legacy of the caliphate, the so-called returnees. We have uh, still people detained, Europeans detained in Syria and Iraq. I'll come to that. We have more and more prison leavers, people who have been either radicalized in prison or have been sentenced for, convicted for terrorism, and they are at the end of, they've served their sentence. And we have, and I, I want to be uh, clear on that, I don't believe it's a major problem, but some cases of refugees who are getting radicalized and, and attracted by these ideas. So let me say one or two words on these four or five uh, categories. The first one, the homegrown, in a recent speech, Andrew Parker, the head of MI5, said, I see here a, a, a real uh, shift. It's not just a spike. After the four terrorist attacks in, in London and Manchester in 2017, um, it's people who are not uh, linked to AQ or Daesh, who are not traveling, who have not traveled to Syria and Iraq. They just get inspired by this ideology. Uh, they, um, and, and, and they are self-radicalized. We know the role of internet, I will say a word, the role of prison, the two major incubators of radicalization, but we have Salafi organization, radical preachers playing a role as well. Um, the challenge here are first to um, the number. Uh, if I take only the three largest member states, the German, the French, and the British, they, they have identified something like 20,000 radical individuals from at, at several stages of the process of radicalization, from the early stage up to uh, the more violent stage. The challenge for the security services and the police is, of course, early detection. Uh, as, soon, as early as we can detect signs of radicalization, we can provide non-security response. How do we do that? Many people in the room know that much better than I do, but community policing, we, we discussed at lunch, plays an important role train frontliners um, to detect these signs that may be social workers uh, in schools and so on. 
Uh, hotlines, when the French Minister of Interior Cazeneuve uh, decided to have a hotline, I said, mm, it will never work. And what, what surprised me a lot, a lot of mothers called the state because they had exhausted all arguments so that their kids uh, were not traveling to uh, Syria and Iraq, and they were turning to the state. Um, and no and no, I understand our security service are even uh, using big data analytics because by processing billions of data, you may discover or detect a change in behaviors. So that's a challenge, but even more difficult, as I understand, is not just to detect some, some signs of radicalization, but more important is to determine what I call the tipping point. Because being radical is not a crime in itself. What is a problem is when someone radical starts preparing uh, an attack. So he downloads a tutorial on, on, on how to build a bomb. He goes to a shop to build the ingredients for building the bomb. And, and, and that is the big problem, because in most of the terrorist, uh, recent terrorist attacks in Europe, all services, they had the data. It's not that they, 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 had, they had not identified that someone was a radical, they, but they, they miss the tipping point. Uh, and I'm the last one to criticize, because I know that it is extremely difficult to do that. But, but that will have uh, some consequences that I will, I will touch uh, later on. And it's interesting when you, you read the, the, the latest version of Contest, the UK uh, city strategy, there is a major shift, conceptual shift, where now they have decided, based on uh, uh, proposal, the Anderson report and so on, that MI5 should start sharing a little bit more their holy intelligence at local level up to, I don't know, even the private sector or NGO, because that's the only way to determine the, 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 the tipping point. I, I find that quite interesting. So homegrown. The second one, returnees, I call the legacy of, of the caliphate. Um, you know, we've had uh, up to 5,000 Europeans who went to Syria and Iraq. Uh, 2,500 um, have not returned yet. We have 1,100 who uh, uh, were killed and 1,500 who have already returned. So the 2,500, it's a lot, it's a lot. Uh, maybe many of them have been killed, but we're not aware. The, the Battle of Mosul was very, very violent, huh? and there are many uh, bodies that have been buried and they've not been identified. Some are still fighting. There is still uh, a small dash of two, two to 3,000 fighters along the Euphrates Valley. Uh, some managed to already leave for another hotspot, Afghanistan, uh, the Sinai, probably other places, Southeast Asia, and some are detained, or uh, mainly detained. We, we, we believe we have um, a bit less, I would say around 2,000 fighters, uh, 666 women, and 1,400 children. And this is, this is quite a challenge. Um, so again, the challenge is first to, to spot them when they return, and on this I think we have improved a lot in Europe, uh, starting with a systematic check uh, on uh, our citizens where they uh, get out of the uh, Schengen zone and they re-enter the Schengen zone before it was purely random. Um, we have uh, done a lot of progress in uh, biometrics, in feeding the different database. I won't go into the detail, but I think we're in a bit better position to spot those who are returning. The second one is to bring them to justice, which uh, raises the issue of uh, getting access to evidence, uh, because you have to uh, prove that someone was uh, fighting alongside Daesh and not with the uh, Free Syrian Army or whatever group. And most of the, uh, the data, most of the evidence we have are digital. And getting a speedy and easy access to digital evidence is not an easy exercise uh, because most of uh, the data are stored, a lot in Ireland, by the way, uh, but a lot uh, are still stored in, in California in a cloud somewhere there. And uh, using MLA request uh, takes time, um, a year in, in the best case. And in the worst scenario, if you want to get access to content, you have to abide by the Fourth Amendment to the US Constitution, which is completely stupid. A would-be jihadist sending a WhatsApp message to another would-be jihadist, an, an Irish, sending a WhatsApp message to another Irish to plan a terrorist attack in Ireland, if the WhatsApp message is stored in Palo Alto, 
you will have to abide by the Fourth Amendment, which requires what they call probable cause, which is much more demanding than what we know, uh, you know in Ireland, we know uh, on the continent. Uh, three, assess dangerousness, um, because when you cannot uh, secure a conviction, you need to uh, monitor the person, and, 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 and uh, you can only monitor those you assess to be the most dangerous one, because I'm told that to uh, monitor so, someone 24-7 uh, takes, what, 20 to 25 uh, uh, staff, and uh, at least in my country, I think we can monitor two or three maximum. And, 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 and five, and we'll come to that, disengage. Uh, whatever the term, it's uh, the radicalization, uh, desistance, uh, desistance, uh, as they say in London now, um, uh, uh, rehabilitation, reintegration, we'll, we'll come to that. So that's the second category. The third one is, uh, and I mentioned that, those who are detained in Syria and Iraq. Uh, what do we do with the, those uh, 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 held by the, the, the SDF, the Kurdish uh, fighters in the, the Kurdish uh, part of Syria. It's, it, there is a war, it's not an official state, but they hold uh, a, a series of Europeans and they won't keep them forever. So that's, that's a question. Uh, do we want to bring them back uh, in, in Europe? Many of them are, are, are not very keen, uh, all the more, that, especially when they don't have enough evidence to secure a conviction because they don't want to monitor them 24-7. Um, and, and those who are detained now are the most dangerous one. You can think that the first wave, some among the first uh, in the first wave were probably driven by different ideas and, and fighting against Assad was probably one of the ideas. But the, late, the, 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 the latest contingent is probably more hardcore jihadist uh, with bad ideas. So um, what do we do with this one? And the second category I just alluded to is women and children. Women or member states are more and more reluctant and they see women like men. Because what we have uh, understood from uh, investigation is that uh, more women than we uh, thought were engaged in religious police, in logistics, in uh, support in any forms, on internet and so on, propaganda, were not that nice. They were not just wives locked in an apartment waiting that the, the husband uh, was coming back from the battlefield. And children. And children, it is an issue. 1,400 children, it's not peanuts. Many were born there, nearly 600. Uh, we have to protect children. Uh, they, 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 they had nothing to do with the caliphate and they had the citizenship of one of our member states. So what do we do? Um, the Convention on the Right of the Children foresee that uh, a child should remain with the mother. Uh, it's in the interest of the child. So member states are asking whether they should bring the mother back, but what I, what I said about women. Uh, so th this is um, a, an issue we'll have to address at some stage. Four categories, the prison leavers. Um, because of lack of evidence in many cases, uh, or because they've just uh, got uh, uh, low sentences, many uh, terrorists uh, will have uh, served their sentence in the coming months and will be released. And most likely, still, they, they will be very, uh, radical, still very radical, unless we have developed effective the radicalization disengagement program in prison, but very few member states have really found the, the, the silver bullet here. But on top of the, those who were convicted for terrorism, we have a high number of people who just got radicalized in prison. They were convicted for small crime or petty crime or, or serious crime, and we've seen this process because in prison it's a quite tough environment. Many people just, uh, they are born again. So they, they convert in a way, they were probably uh, slow, uh, low Muslim, uh, low practice, and they discovered that uh, radical Islam helped them in prison. First, because you joined the dominant group, and that helps against violence, or because it helped you to regain self-esteem. And, and this very black and white ideology may help you to rebuild yourself. And so, if you look at the figures in France, um, uh, the Minister of Justice said that they will have 450 uh, people who will leave prison, 400 uh, convicted for normal crime and 50 uh, for terrorism by uh, end of 2019. 
quite a lot. So, um, so how will we assess the risk and what to do with someone who has, uh, who has served his or her sentence? Normally, they are free. So should we impose additional measures? like on sexual offenders, some regular reporting to the police when you want to go abroad, when you want to change your domicile, or should they have a, an electronic bracelet, or we, we probably need to invent something. If, if we believe, we have assessed that those leaving prison will be quite dangerous. And finally, refugee. I said very, very marginal number, uh, but we see some Salafi organization try to recruit uh, uh, in, in some of our member states. Uh, refugees because they are vulnerable. You don't integrate in German nor in Belgian society overnight. It's a long and, and painful process. So that's a bit uh, uh, the, 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 the variety, the diversity of, of uh, source of threat. Uh, on top of it, we still have the two organizations. Uh, what will happen to uh, Daesh? Will there be something like Daesh 2.0? They will have to reinvent themselves. They um, uh, I think still quite some money. Uh, at the conference uh, hosted by President Macron a month ago in Paris on terrorist financing, the French intelligence service uh, said that they have assessed they were, well, they, they collected up to two billion, but they've probably invested half a billion in the real economy. So they have a flow of regular uh, money, uh, be it in farms in Iraq or real estate in Istanbul or whatever, but they have money. When you have money, you can do a lot. Huh? Uh, and they still have franchises and affiliated groups. So they may evolve like Al-Qaeda after the uh, uh, operation in Afghanistan, uh, after 9-11, a weak center and still very effective uh, affiliated groups. Uh, we don't know. And, and they have uh, uh, groups in Libya, in the Sinai, in Afghanistan, in Yemen, in Southeast Asia, and still in Nigeria with Boko Haram. That's first. The second one is that we, we have a bit forgot AQ, and AQ is still around. It's not just because we've seen the rise of Daesh that AQ had uh, uh, all of a sudden disappeared. In Syria, HTS, Ayat Tahir al-Sham, or a new group called, um, I don't remember, it's quite uh, complicated. It's a formal franchise of AQ operating in Syria, and they are attracting a lot of fighters disillusioned by the geopolitical development there. AQAP in Yemen, AQIM called Jinim in the Sahel, Al-Shabaab uh, and in Afghanistan, uh, less than, than some people uh, suggest, but still active. And I am uh, um, interested by um, an idea uh, floated by one of the best experts of uh, Al-Qaeda, Ali Soufan, a former FBI uh, officer who said, probably we could see a merge between the two. Why? Because the three reasons why they split when Al-Qaeda in Iraq split into Jabhat al-Nusra and Daesh have nearly disappeared. The first one was an ego problem between Baghdadi and al-Zawiri. Al-Zawiri is older and older, and Baghdadi, is he still alive? We heard this week that his son has been killed, but he's not in good shape, to say the least. Second, um, we have uh, the problem of the caliphate. For Al-Qaeda, the caliphate is the long-term goal. For Daesh, it was a very short-term objective. But there is no caliphate anymore, so it's not an issue anymore. And the third reason is the use of violence to promote and impose your ideas. I think AQ learned from their mistake. It's not by beheading people that you will win the hearts and minds. And I think Daesh might go uh, 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 around that process as well. Uh, and, and that's why you see more and more Hamza bin Laden, the son of uh, Osama bin Laden, more and more ecumenic on, on the propaganda. And that would be a good idea for, for, for them to go that, that way. My last uh, penultimate point is what I call the, the black swan. How is it possible that uh, when the Americans left uh, Iraq, when Obama decided to withdraw the troops in uh, 2011, AQI was nearly uh, destroyed? And, and the money they put on, on the head of, of the leader of AQI at the time was nearly nothing. Three years later, Baghdadi in Mosul proclaimed the caliphate. And they attracted 40,000 fighters from 100 countries in the world. How is it that in three years' time, we have seen the rise of the, the most powerful terrorist organization ever, and nobody have, had seen this? It's, it's like the black swan. It, it, we've not been that good huh, to, to see that. 
it may repeat. That's the problem. Do, 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 uh, are we prepared to, to identify much earlier the black swan? Uh, a point that I will develop quickly later on, linked to the threat, in a way, is the unfortunate possibility for a lone actor to use high-tech tool to mount an attack with catastrophic consequences. And I don't want to scare you at all. It's probably science fiction for the time being, but miniaturization, only 28 grams of explosive are enough to blow up a plane, to dawn a, a jumbo. Uh, drones. Um, the nightmare of the security service is to see returnees uh, bringing back the, the expertise they gain in, in, in Iraq and Syria with chemical stuff and drones. They've used drones. So you put chemical on a drone on a football stadium. I don't need to develop more. Uh, cyber. There is nothing for the time being as cyber terrorism. They use cyber uh, more to propagate their uh, stupid ideas and to uh, communicate, to raise money. By the way, very, very uh, strange to see that when you put someone on a sanction list, his bank account is frozen, but the person can keep a Facebook account to do crowdfunding and, and collect money, uh, bitcoins, and, and so on. But that's another. So um, there is nothing like cyber terrorism. But if you have m a lot of money, it should be possible either to go to uh, the suburbs of Moscow or other places and, and, and hire a geek or several good guys, expert in cyber, or to go in the dark web uh, and, and buy what is called a zero day. And a zero day, it's a vulnerability uh, in a software like WannaCry, which was detected by the NSA and leaked uh, uh, through WikiLeaks and used by uh, um, cyber uh, hackers. And artificial intelligence. And, and again, uh, there is a, a huge potential for these disruptive technologies, and we should use them. One idea I have, for instance, is to use um, blockchain to design much less expensive, more robust ways for the diaspora to, to send their money back in their home country instead of using Hawala or paying the fees of, of Western unions. Um, so voila. And, and finally, there are other groups than Daesh and AQ. We have on our terrorist list organizations like the PKK, which is a very serious concern for the, the Turks. Um, we put the military branch of the Hezbollah uh, on the terrorist list as well. Uh, and it's a question I, I want to raise here and I raised during the lunch. In some of our member states, there is a concern on the rise of far right as well. Um, and, and in France, they uh, arrested a group of far right uh, extremists uh, last week and they were planning to kill Muslim refugees and, and so on. And the risk is to see the two uh, feeding each other uh, in a way. Uh, 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 far right and, and on the other hand, uh, radical Islamist uh, each other. So one word on the EU response and then in a telegraphic term, I know I have to speed up on, on, on the challenges. The, the, as I said, in the last three years after the attack, Charlie Hebdo in Paris, uh, we've really boosted our work. And um, the heads of state and government ask us to work more in three main direction, um, more on the repressive side which means uh, a definition of terrorism, how to improve the collection of evidence, especially digital evidence, I mean, fighting against the financing of terrorism, protection of soft targets so that Berlin, uh, um, Toulouse, and so on does not repeat, protection of critical infrastructure, reducing availability of firearms. It was still possible two years ago to buy a Kalashnikov in the center of Brussels in an hour and a half for 300 bucks, nothing. Um, so that's, and border, border control, border uh, uh, management. More on the repressive side, more on the preventive side, and I will say a word because that's a real challenge. How can we, in a way, understand the process of radicalization if we ever will? Uh, and what can we do about that? How can we interrupt this process and, and find the right policy? It's a lot about radicalization in prison. It's a lot about internet important for Ireland. It's about, a lot about uh, um, probably the ideology itself. Uh, we, we're uh, sometimes a bit afraid to raise the issue of radical Islam because we don't want to criticize a religion and, and link up a religion and, and terrorism, but, but there is a, 
the sort of hijacking of Islam for terrorism purposes, and we have to address that and uh, develop uh, um, and, and mainstream more, prevent in a lot of other policies. And during the lunch, someone said we need a whole of government, a whole of society, but a whole of government approach. How can we mobilize more education, uh, um, uh, culture, sport, access to employment, and so on? And the fine, final uh, um, uh, basket of policy where we have been asked to do a lot more is on the external side. How can we um, develop very strong counterterrorism partnership with all our neighbors? Why concentrate on the neighbors? First, because they need a lot uh, of assistance. And, first, and second, because it's our first line of defense. Uh, from Morocco to Turkey, including the Western Balkans, they are all faced with serious problem of radicalization. They need to uh, uh, enrich uh, their city policy, which is often too much repressive and not integrating enough a whole of society, a whole of government approach, not enough uh, prevent, and we do a lot. And so I spend more than half of my time visiting all these countries one by one and trying to see what they need and how we can help. Maybe in, that's, I know I'm too late, but just in telegraphic terms, um, that could be the, the Q&A in a way, the challenge that I see. The first one is the, just the one I mentioned, prevent. Um, can we design? Uh, effective disengagement program. For the time being, we have not developed enough uh, this. Second, on internet. Uh, we've done a lot through a voluntary approach with the internet companies so that they remove unlawful content. Should we move to a next step, which would be a legislation? Three, do we want to address the issue of Salafism in Europe? Uh, again, sensitive issue, but it's on the rise. And that is a concern in several of our member states. Um, the second one is information sharing. We have done a lot in two of the three aspects of what the Americans call an information sharing environment. Collect more, share more, but the third leg, equally if not more important, say analyze better. So collect more, there we have the issue of privacy, and both the European Parliament and the Court of Justice are more and more uh, restrictive on the type of data that we can collect. We've collected data on passengers, the PNR, uh, financial data, internet data, uh, and so forth, but we probably need a, a lot more. But we are confronted with the data protection uh, limit. The second one is encryption. The internet company, after the Snowden leaks, have developed very sophisticated encrypted system, by, which makes the life of a security service much more difficult. Um, and and uh, so that's, that's on the collection. On the sharing, the good news is our, our member states have done a major uh, uh, improvement and are now feeding, populating, and using the different database much better than they were three years ago. And so that's a very good news. We still have an issue about the link between uh, the security services as a group, which is called the CTG, and Europol, or Agency for Law Enforcement Cooperation, and if we want to, to build some links between the two. But the third leg is equally, if not more important, is how to analyze the data that we have collected and we have shared. Because as I've said many, in m most instances, the service had the data, but they didn't analyze the data properly. President Macron launched the idea of creating an European Intel Academy, which I think is a very good idea. And the French are now, the DGSC, the French uh, Security Service, recruiting other profiles, ethnologues, sociologues, linguists, IT specialists. Because on questions as complicated as this one, you need to have different angles different sort of analysis. And I think we need, we need, all of us need to do that a lot more. So that's the third. The, 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 the third one, and, and I stop, um, I take, we need to assess better the, the huge potential of all these disruptive technologies, but also use them positively, but, but assess the, the, the dangerousness. For a culture of public-private partnership, we're not doing enough on that side. And finally, uh, with our external partners, we have a lot of 
issues Brexit, what will the consequence of Brexit be? I don't want to uh, discuss it, it's in the hands of a very able negotiator. Um, the US, we've developed a very strong transatlantic uh, relationship, but we have a lot of tension in many respects, NATO, trade, and so on. We'll have, uh, will it expand to security? Um, and, and, and foreign policy as a whole, because probably if, if, and I come back to what I said at the outset, if we have not been that successful, it's probably because we have not done enough on, on several aspects, development, uh, solving conflict, promoting the rule of law, promoting human rights, and so on. So I'm sorry, I've been much beyond the 25 minutes, but, but I'm more than happy to answer any question you may have.